President Ambassador of Poland to India and accredited to six countries, namely Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Maldives. Before I start, let me briefly introduce Nepal Institute for International Cooperation Engagement. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation Engagement is an independent, apolitical, non partisan think tank which undertakes research on international relations, foreign policy, security studies, and development, which are conducive to the world at large and Nepal in particular. Today's topic is of great relevance, as we all are aware that Russia and Ukraine are at war. Russia has invaded Ukraine since eight months, eight days. The invasion has resulted in the death of more than tens of thousands on both sides, causing Europe's largest refugee crisis since the Second World War. The impact of the Russian Ukraine crisis is not only in Europe, but all over the world. Uh, on the issue of uh, Russia Ukraine, Nepal has supported Ukraine and it has condemned Russian invasion. There are many reports in the media that Nepal follow um, uh, what they call non alignment policy, and Nepal should not have done that. I think people in, in Nepal have failed to interpret non alignment properly. I think non alignment. Is a, is, a, is a policy where you do not take sides when the major power at war. But when the war is on you, when, you have, when there's impact on your own national interest, we take sides. At the same time, we say that we do not take sides of any power permanently, means we are not part of one power all the time. That does not mean that when it serves our national interest, we will not take sides. We take sides based on our national interest. Means we can keep on changing our partners <coughs> based on interest. Here on these issues, we stand with Ukraine because we believe in democracy, we believe in, we believe in the norms and values of the United Nations, we believe in uh, rule of law. That's why I think Nepal, since our foreign policy advocates these policies, we stand with Ukraine. We're not only standing with Ukraine, we're not but, uh, against Russia. We're, we are supporting the values that Nepal firmly believes in. Second conception is that, uh, uh, is that it's the first time that Nepal has taken such sides. It's not the first time. Nepal has always stood with the democratic values. In 1963, I think, Nepal was the only country in South Asia. And we remain the only country for 30 years we stood with Israel. At the time, we didn't have such complications. So several times Nepal believes that Nepal has stood on these kind of principles. And it's not the first time that we stood in Ukraine, we have stood with Israel, and we continue to do that. We are proud of that fact because when the great when the countries that claim to be the greatest, greatest democracies in the world, we have when they do not have taken a sides, we have stood with Ukraine. So I think we really feel proud of that moment that we stood with Ukraine. We, we, we believe in the United Nations Charter, we believe in rule of law, we believe in democracy, and when several countries in the region who claim to be the largest democracy have failed to stand, we have stood with them. So to talk on this very issue, uh, important topic today, we have, you all know that we have a very important person who has been following uh, the crisis uh, from the next door. So we invited uh, His Excellency Professor Adam Borakowski uh, to here in Nepal. We are very grateful that he has spared some time for this talk. Before we start, let me invite uh, Mr. Rajendra Khetan, the chairman of Khetan Group, to deliver the welcome remarks. You're welcome. Namaste, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy that uh, Ambassador is here, who is not only a diplomat, but also an academician. Nepal has a high regards for Poland, not only as a country, but as a country who brings a lot of tourists to Nepal. When you see, uh, you know, we saw COVID, we saw other uh, issues in the mountain range. We found that Polish people were one of the most uh, highly present there. And I've been seeing that they're very dynamic, very honest, and very caretaker. Only person which has been, you know, uh, kind enough to help and cooperate with them. And we are our together, we are one team. It is his crisis, it is my crisis, and we all have to stand together. When it's coming to the, uh, the Ukrainian crisis, definitely we all stand with one word, that's humanity. Your right to survive, your right 
of pure nationalism. We, nobody can compromise on that. It is a very sad story. I hope the global power will settle it very soon. Uh, with these words, welcoming the ambassador, I again request the ambassador to see that more potentiality between Nepal and Poland can be highlighted. And Mr. Golsa is very kind enough to cooperate and support them. And we all back Mr. Golsa to see that Poland-Nepal relation flourishes. The good news is that a lot of Nepalese diaspora is in Poland now, and they are doing very good activities. Uh, in 2013, when I was uh, speaking at NRNA Europe Regional Conference, that was in Switzerland, Zurich, we found that a lot of Nepalese from Poland came. It shows that you know they started their career as a labor, as a staff, as an employee. They have become now soft people, respect owners, and now they are learning to become entrepreneurs. And now they are seeking opportunity to bring those money, their technology, their know-how, their innovation, their knowledge, their think tanks to come to Nepal and link the products between Poland and Nepal. So here I see a lot of potentiality, not only as a police, but as a Nepalese police or police Nepalese, a lot of business can be done. With these words, I welcome all of you, the Academia, uh, the embassies, my old friends and leaders of our community to this show. Thank you everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Keta. And now I'd like to invite uh, to talk on the, today's topic. I'd like to invite His Excellency Professor Adam uh, Burakowski, who is the resident ambassador of Poland to India and accredited to six countries, namely Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh, <coughs> Pakistan, and Maldives. His Excellency is a Polish diplomat, political scientist, and historian, and serving as resident ambassador to India since 2017. He's the professor of the Institute of Political Science at the Polish Academy of Science. He graduated from prestigious University of Warsaw, Faculty of History in 2001, and he completed his PhD in 2007 under supervision of renowned Polish historian Professor Andrzej Pocieszkowski uh, and in habitation in 2015 on politics of Romania. From 2006 to 2017, he worked for the National Broadcaster, Polish Radio, holding various positions related to the international affairs. He was a Polish representative to the European Broadcasting Union and he has evolved, he has also he was also involved in Uranet. He speaks English, Hindi, Romanian and Russian. He's married and has four children. Uh, and Mr. Burakowski, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak a little bit about the topic that is uh, Topic number one for the whole world for more than half a year. And uh, my special um, gratitude uh, I would like to um, give to uh, Professor Manish Tapa, a big friend of Poland who has cooperated for many years with, with Poland and uh, who organized this, uh, this meeting. And uh, for uh, our honorary consul general, Mr. Romania Golchak, who represents uh, Poland in Nepal also for many years, very successful. And so um, this is uh, the biggest problem that we face uh, nowadays. This uh, problem uh, is caused exclusively by Russia and the Russian authorities. And they went to war on their own decision, supported by almost uh, everybody in Russia. And uh, they wanted this war. They want to continue this war. And uh, all the problems that are caused in many parts of the war, uh, war they, the Russia tries to use it on their own benefit. But Maybe uh, I will start with a brief, short history of Russia, Ukraine, and uh, to some extent Poland. So uh, the first uh, really important, powerful country in that uh, region was the Kievian Ruthenia. It was established in Kiev, and the capital was Kiev. 
Um, and uh, it was uh, around 1100 years ago, and uh, they took the Orth Christian Orthodox religion from Constantinople, uh, from uh, the, like the capital of, uh, of um, the Byzantine Empire, who was the, which was the strongest country in Europe at that time. And uh, the Kilian uh, Rus was growing for um, around 300 years uh, with big success, with really rich culture. And the territory of the Kilian Rus was, uh, Kilian Rutenia was uh, um, more or less um, comparable to the territory of nowadays Ukraine. Then it came the um, invasion of uh, Tatars, uh, led by Genghis Khan, the biggest uh, um, leader of uh, Mongolian Tatars, and they destroyed everything. Um, they just invaded uh, first uh, the, which is now uh, Western uh, Russia, then the uh, Kievan uh, Utenia, which is uh, uh, they destroyed completely Kiev. Then they attacked uh, Poland, but then again this Khan died, and uh, there were some internal struggles, so they withdrew. But in the territories of nowadays Russia, they stayed for longer time. They created um, many uh, smaller. Princely states that were um, connected, but also fighting against each other. But the, <coughs> the rule was uh, Tatar, uh, Mongol Tatar, Tatar uh, rule. Then, after um, a few uh, centuries, this uh, uh, Mongolian uh, yoke, as they call it in, uh, in Russian, Mongolski go is uh, start to weaken and the uh, Russian uh, princess emerged and finally they uh, after many uh, wars and battles they uh, won um, the control over the territory of current western Russia. At the same time uh, we observe the rise of Moscow as a, uh, one of the states that, that uh, were there and uh, Moscow was Conquering other other uh, states, the uh, um, political system of Moscow was uh, a very strong militaristic uh, monarchy uh, with uh, no opposition, no discussion, just uh, only um, aim at uh, expand expansion and uh, uh, internal uh, discipline. There were other Russian uh, smaller states which were more democratic. The most democratic was Nizhny Novgorod. Now it's the third uh, city of Russia. And this was uh, a democracy at that time. But at some point in time, Moscow conquered Nizhny Novgorod and destroyed all the democratic, um, democratic uh, traditions. <coughs> Uh, in the uh, next centuries, uh, we uh, observed the, uh, mm, I mean, the first big ruler of Russia was Ivan the Terrible, um, who was obsessed with uh, discipline and terror, and uh, uh, he introduced a very uh, despotic regime in his country, but at the same time, he expanded this country a little bit, and his followers followed that trend, so strengthening the discipline within Moscow and expansion. And this continued to 18th century when uh, Russia was already quite big, and uh, then it came another important ruler, Peter the Great, who established a new city, St. Petersburg. Uh, now is the second uh, city of Russia, um, and he introduced uh, some reforms that made 
Russia look more like a European state, but only on the surface. The inner mechanism of that state was the despotic tyranny. Um, then Russia expanded further west and further east. They conquered the Siberian nations, they subdued the Siberian nations, the Caucasus nations, and also to the west, unfortunately Poland, but also the, the, the Ukraine, the Baltic states, and um, they, um, at some moment in time, after uh, the um, French invasion of Russia, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, the Russians uh, defeated Napoleon and then went up to Paris. Um, in 19th century, uh, Russia was uh, one of the strongest countries in the world, uh, but still, still very despotic, but also with some economic progress. The internal uh, contradictions uh, of the um, very big country as Russia was at that time um, led to a failure uh, of the Tsarist system and to the outbreak of the October Communist uh, Revolution, which was during the First World War. The communists uh, introduced even more despotic uh, system and even more uh, bloody regime. Um, after the, uh, having the um, civil war between so-called white Russians, which were loyal to the Tsar, and red Russians, the communists, the, the reds won. Then they made a, a so-called collectivization, which was a total destruction of uh, agriculture and creating uh, the state-run uh, agriculture, big agriculture uh, in industry. And uh, it led, uh, during, during this uh, collectivization, they killed many uh, millions of, uh, of um, peasants who didn't want to uh, be included in, in this uh, system. Then, <coughs> uh, uh, I mean, simultaneously, the uh, Soviet Union invaded Poland in 1920, but we defeated them at the Battle of Warsaw, and uh, for 20 years, uh, Poland uh, was uh, independent. In late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, Stalin, the new leader of, uh, of Soviet Union, uh, he uh, made an artificial uh, hunger in Ukraine, uh, which killed, according to different statistics, uh, from four to eight million people. It was a pure artificial uh, operation, uh, which is now uh, still in the memory of Ukrainians. Then, then came the Second World War, when um, first uh, uh, Soviet Union was the closest ally of Nazi Germany, and there was a Stalin-Hitler pact to um, um, conquer the Central Europe. Uh, first, uh, the Germans attacked Poland, then the Soviets, uh, 17 days <coughs> later. And also, the Baltic states were um, annexed by, um, by the Soviet Union and uh, a part of uh, nowadays I mean, of that day, Romania, which is now the Republic of Moldova, and uh, I mean, the, this annexed part was, was a little bit bigger. Um, then uh, Germany attacked the Soviet Union. Um, this was a very big uh, war, fi finally won by the Soviet Union, which uh, resulted in uh, conquering by uh, Soviet Union all the territories up to uh, Eastern Germany, uh, with including Berlin, and uh, they created an um, artificial state of uh, of um, of Eastern Germany with Berlin as a capital, but also 
uh, they subdued all the countries of Central Eastern Europe and introduced uh, communism into these countries. Uh, some countries were incorporated in the Soviet Union, like Ukraine and Baltic states, and some were not, and was, were pseudo-independent, uh, like Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia at that time, or the country that I mentioned, this artificial uh, East Germany. Then the communism collapsed. In uh, 1989, the countries of Central Eastern Europe became independent. Poland was the leader of these changes. And then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, many countries, uh, Baltic states, Ukraine, the Caucasus countries, and Central Asian countries became independent. Uh, but it was done during the, the period of, uh, of communist uh, leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, he is uh, often perceived as a democrat, he definitely was not. He wanted to revive the empire, he wanted to incite inter-ethnic uh, clashes, uh, to play with it, and he wanted to, uh, to so Soviet Union to be even bigger. He was the first uh, leader uh, who uh, came up with the uh, slogan that there is one space between Vladivostok, which is in the far east of Russia, and Lisbon. Uh, they wanted to uh, converse the Western Europe to some kind of Soviet uh, republics. Or this vision <coughs> was not clear at that. But he was incapable of that, and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. But within Russia, this militaristic uh, trend and the autocratic trend became even stronger. During uh, times of Boris Yeltsin, they invaded, uh, I mean, they made a war in Chechnya, a very bloody war. And then there was another war in Chechnya. Uh, the first years of Putin's rule, and the inner domestic propaganda was has always been very militaristic. And uh, then in 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. In 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine for the first time. Uh, they uh, annexed the Crimea, uh, and uh, they created artificial uh, fake uh, republics uh, of Donetsk and uh, Luhansk. Mm. And then this, uh, all this mm, trend continued up to the point when they invaded Ukraine for the second time. Now I come back uh, his, in the history for, uh, to uh, say about Ukraine a few words. Uh, Ukraine is the direct uh, um, uh, successor of the country that I mentioned, the Kievan Rutenia, Kievan Rus. Um, Kiev was the, the capital of that state, but uh, after the Mongol Tatar invasion, the key Kiev was destroyed and uh, the stateness in, the, the, in that region as well. Um, then uh, this uh, region was uh, occupied by some Tatar, uh, Mongol Tatar states, and some uh, western part of this, um, um, which, is, which is nowadays Ukraine, uh, was uh, incorporated into Poland. Then the uh, to Poland and to Lithuania, bigger, bigger part to Lithuania. Then the, uh, Poland and Lithuania created one state, the Commonwealth of both nations. Of, um, had, uh, it was called, and uh, the territories of nowadays Ukraine were part of this state. Polish Lithuanian state was a democratic state. Uh, I mean, in the conditions of that. Uh, that period. 
uh, which means uh, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. The king was elected, and there was a parliament, and um, the representatives of the gentry, of the upper class, had the um, uh, right to vote. All the uh, decisions were made on a democratic way. But the Ukrainians, uh, they uh, felt that uh, they are somehow neglected. I mean, this country was Polish Lithuanian, but where was the Ukrainian part? And so um, many of them um, uh, accepted the, this uh, state and uh, um, cooperated with uh, the state of Poland. Uh, Lithuania became an uh, important member of uh, the ruling elite, but some of them rebelled. They wanted uh, independent uh, Ukraine. And after uh, uprising of Bogdan Chmielnicki, uh, Chmielnicki made a decision to um, have a uh, cooperation with Tsarist Russia, the so-called Treaty of Pereyaslav, uh, which was in 1657. Uh, was the beginning of the period of Ukrainian-Russian cooperation. They thought that uh, um, <coughs> Russians might be a better uh, ally than Poles. Mm, in, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying very, very much, but this was like the um, the <coughs> core uh, thinking of Ukrainians at, at that time. In uh, late 18th century, uh, Poland unfortunately lost its independence um, and the territories of uh, nowadays Ukraine uh, were divided between Russia and uh, Austria. The eastern part went to Russia and uh, the uh, western, southern western to uh, to Austria. Uh, in 19th century, we observed the uh, emerging national movement of uh, Ukrainians in both countries, in Russia and in Austria. And they started to realize that uh, uh, Russians are uh, maybe their good friends, but uh, they want independent Ukraine, uh, which Russia was against. Uh, during the First World War, and just after that, when uh, we, uh, the, there was this uh, Bolshevik communist revolution in Russia, Ukrainians uh, proclaimed the, their uh, new country, new state, the a Popular Republic of Ukraine, uh, which was uh, crushed by uh, Soviet uh, <coughs> Russia. Part of them cooperated with Poland and, uh, and they wanted to uh, uh, establish a, a state which will be a uh, ally of Poland in the territories of nowadays uh, Central and Eastern Ukraine. But this uh, also failed. Unfortunately, because of the uh, rising uh, communist, uh, Soviet communist uh, power. Then, uh, after the First World War, after establishing of communism in Ukraine, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, Ukraine was uh, uh, divided between the, the part that was under Soviet rule and part that was in Poland. Um, what happened in uh, the Soviet Union to Ukraine, I already said, there was an uh, artificial uh, hunger which killed from uh, four to eight to million people. In Poland, the inter-ethnic uh, relations between Poles and Ukrainians were uh, not the best, um, but also, I mean, uh, it was much better than in Soviet Union. Uh, with no comparison. 
then um, the Second World War started. And the Ukrainians, um, the nationalist movement of uh, of Ukraine, uh, saw it as a chance to re-emerge as a new independent state in cooperation with Germany. Um, this idea failed, and unfortunately, the uh, nationalists uh, of Ukraine they uh, became very inspired by the Nazi uh, uh, ideas and uh, they uh, started ethnic cleansing in the territories of Eastern Poland. They killed uh, around 100,000 uh, Poles because of nationalistic uh, reasons. Then after the Second World War, the whole territory of uh, Ukraine uh, was incorporated into the Soviet Union and in 1954, uh, or 64, I'm sorry, I, uh, um, the Crimea was added to uh, to, uh, to Ukraine, and Crimea was a world of its own. Uh, it was the one of the longest um, uh, Tatar state there, the Crimean Tatars. <coughs> Um, the ethnic combination of, of, uh, of Crimea was very complex. Uh, Stalin uh, deported the, Ukrainian, the Crimean Tatars to Siberia, then they returned. Um, and uh, uh, Crimea became a part of the Soviet Republic of, of Ukraine. Um, in 1991, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Ukraine became an independent state and uh, tried to be uh, more... Um, I mean, they had to uh, reinvent uh, what, uh, in which direction uh, they should go. There were uh, many um, ideas, many options. One uh, option was uh, to still be friends with Russia, and the other option was pro-Western. Uh, during this uh, the course of time, the pro-Western option became more and more important, for obvious reasons. Uh, Russia is a country uh, which is not as attractive as they think. Uh, this is a lot of poverty, uh, uh, autocracy, and the uh, Western countries, uh, the democracy offered uh, economic progress um, and uh, incorporation slowly but uh, visible uh, into common market of European Union. At some point in time, uh, the European Union uh, offered a visa-free regime for Ukrainians. Many Ukrainians started to uh, live in uh, Western countries, including Poland. Uh, before this war, uh, we had already one million uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian migrant workers. Uh, so this pro-Western uh, trend became more and more important. Uh, in 2014, there was um, a big uh, revolution in Ukraine. The, uh, uh, the team of uh, Viktor Yanukovych had to escape, he himself escaped to Russia and the popular forces, uh, pro-Western, uh, started, I mean, came to, came to power and this uh, occupation of Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk was just a Russian reaction. Um, in recent years, uh, Ukraine made a very big progress in terms of democratization of the state, fighting against corruption, and uh, general level of uh, living. Um, they wanted to be more, to be much closer to the European Union, um, and uh, they started really progressing economically. And this, I think, was the uh, one of the main causes of uh, the decision of uh, Russian leadership to attack Ukraine. Because 
as I said, for 300, 350 years, these two nations had many uh, connections. There were many mixed families between Russia and Ukrainians, and uh, many friendships. So the Russian society could be influenced by democracy, which was a major and deadly threat to Putin and his uh, regime. Because Ukraine was a really an example that uh, democracy does much better than autocracy. So um, Russia decided to stop it in a military way. But they miscalculated, uh, which is obvious. Uh, they won't, I mean, everybody said uh, from the Russian side at the very beginning that uh, there might be three, uh, three days war or something like this. We have more than half a year. I mean, uh, which, but this was a surprise because if somebody knew uh, Ukraine uh, to s even to a small extent, I, I'm not an expert of Ukraine, but I have many Ukrainian friends. I knew that they were, they would be fighting and finally they would win. Um, I don't know why Russians did not know it, but certainly they did. So Russia started this war and at the, on the very, very first day of, uh, of this war, Poland and other uh, countries uh, of uh, the European Union, um, our allies from NATO, United States, uh, Canada, uh, other uh, countries uh, that share the values of uh, freedom of uh, democracy, they started to help Ukraine. Um, we received, Poland received uh, around two, three million refugees. Um, they are, 90% of them are women and children. Ukrainian children started to be uh, accepted into Polish schools from the day one. Um, and uh, since our language is very similar to Ukrainian, uh, we just have different alphabet, but uh, the sound is, is similar in uh, the grammars as well. Uh, they, uh, they are doing very good in, in Polish schools. Of course, we want them to return to their country after the war and to reconstruct the, uh, the country after all this destruction caused by Russia. Um, we started also to uh, send weapons to Ukraine in large numbers. Um, and we have sent uh, around 300 tanks. Uh, we uh, sent <coughs> many loitering munition and uh, some other kind of uh, heavy weapons. Mm, we are also helping them in, uh, in financially, as the other countries of this uh, coalition do. Also, Russia has been many times uh, condemned in the United Nations and uh, really, as you said, sir, and then Nepal is um, uh, supporting this, uh, which um, I'm not surprised because I know that uh, Nepal uh, is a country when, where you really cherish freedom and uh, stability and uh, uh, Nepal is um, very perfectly uh, aware what is international order and why it is, should, should not be broken. And so Russia broke all the uh, international laws uh, since they were incapable of uh, winning this war they started to, to kill the civilians uh, which is easier because uh, for obvious reasons it's uh, more difficult to kill the armed soldier than un un unarmed children, um, so the, there are many uh, uh, proofs of Russian war crimes uh, in many places. Bucha near Kiev was one of the first, uh, but also Izium, Mariupol, the uh, siege of Mariupol was uh, very deadly for civilians. Russia also uh, is kidnapping children from Ukraine. Uh, the Russian army on order, they are raping women and children and they are torturing people. 
um, to break the spirit of Ukrainians. Now, in the last uh, two weeks, they started once again to uh, attack uh, the civilian infrastructure from air. Um, but uh, finally, they will lose this war. It will be a very long story, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Ukraine will win this war and that the uh, spirit of uh, freedom uh, will uh, be stronger than this despotic, autocratic uh, regime of Russia. Um, we, uh, as uh, Poland, uh, as I said, we not only um, accept refugees, but, uh, but we also help uh, in many other ways. And we uh, ask every, uh, every other country to help. Uh, and just uh, as the con not, a, not as the conclusion, but at the end of my speech, I wanted to um, say a few words about um, Polish-Nepalese cooperation in the first phase of the war. So when Russia invaded, uh, uh, there were um, a few hundred uh, Nepalese, uh, mainly students in, in Ukraine, um, and some entrepreneurs or some tourists. And uh, um, via Poland, around 600 of them escaped uh, and returned to Nepal. It was already a good cooperation because we are friends, we are friendly countries, and we will remain friendly. Also, um, after the defeat of Russia, we will cooperate uh, friendly and um, we will uh, strengthen this, this friendship further more. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, invite you also to the uh, International Mountaineering uh, Mountain Museum in Pokra, where yesterday we opened a new exhibition of a Polish um, um, mountaineering Himalayan hero, um, the first uh, European, first Polish lady uh, who climbed up to Mount Everest, Miss Wanda Rutkiewicz. Um, she was also the first woman to uh, conquer the K2. And uh, the year 2022 um, uh, is nominated by the Parliament of Poland as a year of Wanda Rutkiewicz because we uh, celebrate uh, and commemorate uh, uh, 30 years after she passed away while uh, climbing uh, Kanchenjunga here in Nepal as well. So thank you uh, very much and uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you, Excellency, for your remarks. It was a really comprehensive and detailed account of the war that is taking place in Europe. We hardly have 15 minutes, so uh, let's take three or four questions. Uh, uh, thank you for your very interesting <coughs> presentation, but very political <coughs> presentation. Uh, you talked about there are lots of refugees in the detention center in Poland. Uh, roughly, could you uh, just figure out how <coughs> larger is the number? Not exact, but tentatively. Mm -hmm. Question number one. Okay. Question number two, why uh, Russia is kidnapping the mm -hmm. children? What is the mm -hmm. politics behind it? Yes raping the women and mm -hmm. destroying. These are the uh, very uh, similar features uh, all around the world during the war. Mm -hmm. Kidnapping the children by that country from the uh, Ukraine. What is the reason behind it? Third question, you at the end concluded your uh, lecture uh, with reference to nepal Poland relationship how nepal poland relationship could help mm -hmm. to reduce this situation of Ukraine mm -hmm. and create harmony through our relationship. Thank you. Okay, so let me answer. 
So uh, the um, exact number of refugees is very hard to trace. Um, um, the uh, pre-war population of Ukraine was around 40, 41 million. Um, so this is one figure. Second is that from the beginning of the war, seven million people from Ukraine crossed the border to Poland. Uh, but uh, also they crossed the border to other countries, to uh, Hungary, uh, Slovakia and Romania, and to the Republic of Moldova. And among these seven million, there are not only refugees, uh, because many people came uh, from both sides. So uh, we, estab we estimate the number of refugees uh, in Poland at around two million, uh, and the total number of refugees from Ukraine if I'm not mistaken, this uh, stat is around six, seven million. Yes. Uh, but the more exact numbers, uh, they might be accessible in internet uh, sources. And uh, you raise a very important question why they are kidnapping children. Because uh, Russia has a very big demographic problem. Um, their uh, life expectancy of men is very low because of alcoholism, which is uh, like a plague in Russia. And uh, very, uh, very uh, weak uh, family bounds. Uh, they don't have children. And uh, as I said, the uh, average age of men are, is very low, mainly because of alcoholism, of uh, drugs, and, uh, um, and uh, they uh, want to increase uh, the number of, of Russians, and Russia is obsessed by skin color. This, is, this, this country has like, full obsession. Uh, they don't, they uh, want white. Um, they don't like the ethnic minorities, uh, especially Asian in Siberia. Um, and the first uh, soldiers that were forced to attack Ukraine were composed mainly of Siberian uh, origin people because they wanted to use this war also as ethnic cleansing within Russia. So um, this is uh, this is the thing. And third. Nepal, uh, Nepal is uh, already uh, helping uh, uh, by supporting the votes in the United Nations, um, and uh, uh, we are we know that Nepal is very far from uh, this, <laughs> and we cherish the, the friendship with, uh, with Nepal, and we really uh, see that the level of understanding of this whole story in Nepal is much higher than in many other countries. Thank you. Thank you. You have also made, you mentioned that uh, Russia will lose this war eventually. Mm -hmm. And and there is unconfirmed report that there is some tension going in between Russia and you know power uh, system itself. Mm -hmm. So how risky the Russian president if he's challenged in the power? Do you think that this conflict will remain within Ukraine and it's going beyond Ukraine? Mm -hmm. That's the point. Yes, so um, as I said uh, that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was the first leader uh, that uh, wanted to go up to Lisbon. And uh, he, this idea is uh, popular among Russian elite. The most vocal uh, right now uh, of this idea is uh, Alexander Dugin, the um, uh, ideologue um, behind this. Uh, it's very influential in Kremlin. He also wanted to go uh, to Lisbon. Um, and uh, I'm absolutely sure that uh, Russians uh, will attack uh, next country if Ukraine fails, but it will never happen. I mean, Ukraine will not fail. But they, they want to attack other countries, and they are quite open about it. Um, um, there uh, was some uh, poll, uh, opinion poll uh, in Russia, which country to attack next, 
and the number one was Poland. So we are aware that uh, they could attack us, but uh, we are not afraid. Uh, we will win this war, and uh, Ukraine will win this war. Uh, I mean, before they attack us, Ukraine uh, will win this war. Concerning the power uh, struggle within the Kremlin, uh, I, I'm not an expert. I, I cannot uh, comment. Okay. So. So, um, so the current state of war is changed from from uh, from from January February. Uh, Ukraine now has started to attack as well. Mm -hmm. So that is that. But what's the diplomatic route? Uh, how is it going? Uh, how uh, neighboring countries like Poland, and EU, and you know, Western allies they are thinking of? Diplomatically settling this war. What's the state of uh, status of that? Um, so I would like to believe you can uh, win this war, as you said. Um, but who would review would be for that? Have you thought of that? Would the EU come into rebuilding mm -hmm. Ukraine, or Ukraine uh, has to do it on the whole, or the, you know Russia, or you know the Allied force mm -hmm. would, would bring in Russia to? Yes, so um, I'm absolutely sure that Ukraine will win this war because the fighting spirit is uh, extremely high in Ukraine and extremely low in Russia. And uh, also the uh, Russian weapons, uh, they uh, really showed that they are of inferior quality. Uh, Ukraine is being provided by uh, really good quality uh, Western Polish uh, weapons. Uh, it will take a longer time, but uh, then Ukraine should be uh, rebuilt, as you said, sir, um, because the destructions are uh, very high. Uh, cities like Mariupol are almost raised to the ground. Uh, this is also a method to, um, of war used by Russians destroy the civil infrastructure. It's like uh, uh, Germans uh, under Hitler, they use the same. Uh, so um, Ukraine will be rebuilt and uh, uh, Poland uh, is already taking part in many discussions about the reconstruction program for Ukraine um, within the European Union and also in some broader coalitions like donor, donor conferences or um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, the world will help, help Ukraine to rebuild after this uh, war and national occupation. Thank you so much. Yes, last question. Like, uh, what I wanted to relate was on the the smaller states in Europe always have been facing so many challenges. Now, when things are shifting to the Indo-Pacific region, I think there are smaller states in this part of the region who will slowly start uh, facing the pressures. You know? So my question is, what made Poland join the Warsaw Pact? What was, what was that compelled you to join the Warsaw Pact in 1955, I think? Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the reason behind it? Like, uh, the main reason was it made political or that made you attract from the Okay, uh, so there are two uh, questions. First is about the smaller states. So the smaller states uh, are protected by the international law. And uh, we should all really fight for strengthening the international law, which Russia is fighting against. Russia doesn't like the international law. And Warsaw Pact was a uh, Soviet invention. Poland has absolutely nothing to, to, to say uh, because that the Poland was ruled by uh, communists uh, imposed by Russia. So like a foreign rule. Um, so they, they joined this uh, Warsaw Pact. I mean, uh, Warsaw in this name was just a rule. I mean, it was provided by Polish communists. Um, so when communism uh, um, fell, 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 uh, fell down, Poland made the only possible decision that was uh, the will of the whole society to join the Western Alliance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Excellency. May I now request Dr. Manis Tata to deliver to the thanks.
thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome and thank Professor His Excellency Adam Parasosi. Um, interestingly, my relationship with Poland started uh, uh, when Poland joined the European Union. Your Excellency, I went to Poland when, as an observer for Nepal when Poland joined the European Union in 2004 uh, uh, as, as one of the delegates from Nepal. Uh, and unfortunately, my second visit was very historic in Poland because my second visit was that day when, uh, when Poland lost most of its military and political elite uh, during the Katyn uh, accident in Smolensk. Smolensk. Yes. Smolensk, yes. Smolensk, not Katyn. Yes. So, so I think uh, it really, you know, when, when, I, when I was in Poland, I, I started, you know, I did my postdoc there. I, I, I kind of facilitated a lot of students uh, to uh, student exchange between Poland and Nepal. Uh, and obviously the academic collaboration. But you know, one thing that always struck when I am in Poland is basically the wish for freedom for all the people. Because you know, if you if you walk to the alleys of Warsaw, you will see all the Tibetan flags uh, on, on the houses of, of Polish people. So you know, the, the zeal for freedom and, and supporting you know freedom, human rights, and democracy is always the, the heart core of Polish people. Uh, and that's what we are now seeing in this crisis as well. You know, I have a lot of my friends in Poland. Who are basically accepting, you know, uh, the Ukrainians to be in their homes, you know, as the family member. Uh, you know, even we had a crisis like that. You know, when we had, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of, you know, Bhutanese refugees. You know, we put them in a camp. But yeah, here, Poland is no, no exactly. camp. Yeah, yeah so it. it's it's not there. You know, so it's They're all in the private people houses. accept them as their family members yes. and as a responsibility as their brothers and sisters. So this always, you know, uh, really fascinates me. So thank you, Professor. For this and, and honorary consul uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much.